So hi everyone, uh, thanks very much for uh, the invite for this brilliant event and for all the, all the work that has gone to organizing it. So far it's really good, I'm really enjoying it. Uh, so my name is Robbie Egan, um, uh, as Rose was saying, and I'm Secondary Schools Development Officer with Green Schools Travel. And today I'm going to talk to you a bit about understanding and addressing the cycling gender gap in Irish secondary schools, which is essentially the, the whole aim of the Anxious Cycles campaign. So just to begin then, uh, green, a bit of introduction to Green Schools Travel. I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with it, but I'll just, I'll just breeze through some of the, the kind of, um, just to introduce it a bit. So firstly, it's the fourth theme of the Green Schools program. Um, it's funded by DTAS and the National Transport Authority. 90% uh, of Irish schools are registered for it, and there are 25 uh, travel officers nationwide. And the aim overall of Green Schools Travel is to encourage students, parents, and teachers to cycle, park and stride, use public transport or carpool instead of using the private car on the school run. And just in terms of some of our activities in relation to developing cycling in particular, so we, uh, we roll out cycle parking, we conduct cyclability audits with students as well, some of you may have engaged in some of them. We also have cycle ride grants for primary schools in particular. Then we do a getting gear a course for, for adults uh, cycling with students. We do group cycles and engage with cycle buses as well. So just a bit about the anti cyclist campaign. So some of you might be familiar with it, some of you mightn't. Uh, so I'll just go through the origins and the aims of the campaign before I talk a bit today about the research that we've been doing. So first of all, uh, according to the Central Statistics Office data from 2016, uh, about 2.1% 2 of 13 to 18-year-olds frequently cycle, mainly to school. Um, out of this 2.1%, only 0.2% are female, and 1.9% the remainder are male then. So overall then, uh, even a very small percentage, 2.1%, only 1 in 10 of those are female. So there's a massive gender gap, it seems, particularly with teenagers cycling to school. So the aim of the, the Archie Cycles campaign is to explore, to understand, and to address the gender barriers to cycling in second level. So just some of the things we've done so far with the Archie Cycles campaign. <clears throat> so you can see there, um, Katrina Bogle, just in the, in the middle of that picture, uh, she was the secondary skills development officer before, and she worked with the, the, the travel manager, Jane Hackett, Rebecca Flanagan, Kira Norton, and others in the organization to develop and roll out the campaign. So one of the first things that happened was pilot focus groups with uh, girls in Dublin, in Dublin schools. And what was found was there were some issues to do with stigma on cycling, some issues to do with, with it being uncool to cycle as a girl, and as well issues of harassment and street harassment as a cyclist. Uh, so out of this early research then, a, a campaign was developed. This involved a video, which we're going to show after this slide, uh, publicity in the form of a billboard campaign, and a panel event launch, with, which happened in the science gallery, which, which hopefully some of you have uh, either watched or been at. <clears throat> and in this panel event, you can see there the list of panelists. You had um, Tara Stewart, who would be a social media influencer and, and someone who works in media, Dr. Catherine Garker, who's a health psychologist, and then two panelists who are actually cyclists in school, one of which is, a, is an elite athlete in cycling, and another who actually cycles in as an everyday thing to school. So what this actually allowed was a, a kind of dialogue to happen about what causes the gender gap and what can we do to fix it, basically. Uh, and following this, then, there was a nationwide rollout of panel events, uh, but unfortunately that was cut short due to COVID. So we managed to get one in Mayo, but we, are, we actually managed to do uh, about 13 to 14 focus groups across the country. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Uh, so just some other things then as well. We've created some research-informed interventions, one of which is the anti cycles Ambassador Program. And at the moment, we're very proud to announce that we have 25 ambassadors to date, and they've been doing some great work on Instagram, social media and there should be more coming in that end. So I think next is a video, is it, Rose? How are you? Good. Lovely to meet you. You too. So now I know this all might look a little bit easier. I used to cycle a lot. In first year when I first started, I was so self-conscious about it. Uh, I felt like everything was like stopping me from cycling to school. Fear of being judged. Fear of being judged by people. Loads of the lads cycle to school. They just see girls as like dresses and skirts and makeup and like boys as like oh bikes and like athletic stuff. Peer pressure is literally everything. Oh, this sounds really stupid but I really do think the helmet is such a big part of it. If you see a lad on a bike it's not really, it's not really different. 
that you just think of it as, yeah. But like if you see a girl on their bike in her uniform or something, it's it's different. I feel like you just need one person to do it. There's nothing better than just like cycling and just seeing like the canal for me, like the whole like stretch along. Instead of a 30 minute walk, it was like a five minute cycle. I've completely got back into it. The way you can push yourself and then after you just feel so great. Like I don't like the fact that other girls will be like, oh, I would never get on a bike because of what they think. When like they won't ever get to experience like how it actually feels and stuff like that. You're sweaty and you look awful, but like you just feel good about yourself. Yesterday when I went for a cycle, I saw two of my old friends like on the road and they're two boys and like I saw them being like like what's she what's she doing on a bike? I just I didn't care like I gave them a big smile and waved. Like, oh people are gonna look at me, like people are gonna see me. I'm like, yeah. You're your own person, you do you. I think you just you build up this mental state of like, oh god, oh no, this lack of confidence in yourself that's probably associated with other things and you're like, hold on, it's a bike. So yeah, so uh, I'll talk a little bit about the research. So just some, uh, so this, as I was saying, this is from about 14 focus groups across the country uh, that were carried out by travel officers in the organization. And uh, one of the kind of uh, provisional, and this, these are just provisional themes, one of the kind of major patterns that, is, that has come out of, of the conversations we've had with teenage girls across the country is that cycling is, is mainly seen as a boys thing, uh, as something that's mainly just for boys and that girls don't seem to have the same accessibility to cycling as boys. And there's a generally a fear of judgment with cycling as a girl. So some of the, uh, one of the kind of three main aspects of cycling as a boys thing then I'll talk about. Firstly is incompatible femininity, and I'll describe what that means. Masculine performance, and then lastly, gendered permission. So what you can see there at the top is just the, the overall kind of theme. And then underneath, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the actual girls were saying in the focus groups. So incompatible femininity, what does that mean? Well, basically what I mean by incompatible femininity is that trying to be a girl and trying to, uh, to meet social expectations about how to be feminine as a girl seem to be incompatible with practicing cycling in Ireland at the moment in second level for a lot of teenage girls. So just some examples here. Uh, one of the focus group participants talked about their hair. So your hair is just everywhere over the helmet bike and you can't really fix it in school, like not properly anyway. So you're kind of just walking around all day with your hair just like sticking up everywhere. So you can see here this particular participant sees an issue with cycling in, having long hair, uh, and as well maybe the expectation to have long long hair for some girls that they experience, uh, and then the kind of the sweatiness or cycling with a helmet, messing up this kind of cultivated look of having your hair in a certain way coming into school, and then not having the facilities then to fix it when you're coming in. So you can see one, one problem there in terms of the incompatibility between cycling, and then also trying to maintain certain expectations of what, what you're meant to look like as a girl. So next then, I don't think a lot of girls in school would choose to wear trousers instead of the skirt just so they could cycle to school. And it's probably too much hassle to come in not wearing a skirt because you'd have to change. I think you would probably have to come in earlier to get changed. So I think it's kind of unnecessary. <clears throat> so you can see here, uh, this particular participant brings up the issue of, of wearing trousers and cycling in. And also contrast that with wearing a skirt and cycling in and the problems with, with both. Uh, so this is something that's often brought up in relation to cycling, the issue to do with uniforms. But you can see here that there's actually there's actually some problems there as well. That even if you have the choice to wear trousers, some people won't wear it because they feel like it won't meet, they won't look very feminine, or they won't feel like a girl if they wear them, they'll feel like, more like a boy wearing trousers. So there's kind of a, a complexity there between cycling in and the, the nuisance of wearing a skirt or having to change from trousers to a skirt and then also um, the expectation to, to feel like you should be wearing a skirt as a girl. So just a little bit more here then as well. I think that like it's more like me, because if I was to cycle on a bike, I think I would be self-conscious of how it looks, because it looks very awkward if you're cycling in a skirt. Like. So you can see here, and, and the word self-conscious, I'd say a lot of people resonate with that feeling of, of feeling self-conscious if you're cycling as a girl. Uh, as, whereas for boys, it maybe sometimes it's considered second nature, it's considered nothing to comment on or think about, it's just unremarkable. Uh, so yeah, this particular participant talks about how uh, she feels like she looks very awkward cycling in a skirt. So once again, you can see the problem, that you don't feel like you should be wearing trousers, because it might seem a bit masculine, but then if you're wearing a skirt and trying to look more feminine, it's actually very awkward. So you feel like it's, it's a kind of dilemma about how to cycle in a way that still feels like you're meeting feminine expectations. 
you'll be kind of like sweaty and you'll be like not clean and it'll kind of like not ruin your day but it'll kind of be like you'd be wearing your high vis your helmet you'd probably be wearing your raincoat and like you wouldn't be able to wear your skirt it'd just be like ugly you kind of look you kind of look different like strange so once again th th this idea of wearing kind of cycle apparel and cycling into school maybe it doesn't just doesn't look in, in a way that, that meets uh, feminine expectations or, or expectations of, of how you should look as a girl. And this, is, this leads to self-consciousness and it leads as well to a sense that cycling is a boy's thing and, and it saves a boy's thing. So just one more then to do with incompatible femininity. I think that it's a masculine thing. Why? Stereotypes, I suppose. It looks cool on boys. Sometimes older people tell me, oh, that's not ladylike. And that kind of puts it into your head. I have to act like a lady. And then you get put into those stereotypes automatically. And then it gets hard to get out of it and to do things you're not stereotyped to do. So I think this participant very eloquently gives an example of how there's certain expectations to be feminine as a girl or to act in ways that are coded as feminine. Um, and then you get put into these kind of stereotypes and it's hard to break free of them then. And that's kind of part of the problem of why cycling stays and is socially defined as a boys thing for girls. So just a little bit more. So on the one hand, cycling can be seen as a boys thing because it's incompatible with social expectations regarding femininity. In another sense, then uh, cycling can be seen as, a, as an actual performance of being a boy or, or, or masculinity. Uh, so I'm just going to give you some examples once again from some, some of the girls in the focus groups of how they perceive cycling. <clears throat> I feel like it's just like certain stuff gets pushed towards certain genders when you get to a certain age. So like that was more like self push towards the fellas cycling she's talking about, but like certain other stuff that's considered more feminine is pushed towards the females. So like that's something like everyone did it in primary, but the minute you get to this age, that's more of a fellas thing. So that's moving from primary to secondary school. But that's just literally society. Same with like you wouldn't see you wouldn't really see a fella doing his hair in the morning, doing his makeup every morning. There is people who do that, but like that is something more that was more pushed towards like girls. Well, like other stuff was certain it was was pushed towards like sports and stuff was pushed towards fellas and you can even see that as well in the video uh, which hopefully you can watch afterwards as well or have watched before this idea that girls have things and boys have things and that girls should engage in girls things and boys should engage in boys things and cycling once again is is continually uh, created and constructed as a boys thing and, and it's seen as kind of a natural thing that boys do or is pushed towards boys as well like people say like dancing would be more like a girl's type of thing and then like cycling and football would be more of a fella's type of thing. Like as well, if you see a girl like, you know, doing football or something, people would be like giving the eyes and all. So I think it's just, so you can see here as well that idea of the eyes and all uh, and then going back to self-consciousness. I'd imagine maybe some of you uh, who are girls who, who cycle to school or do cycle to school might sometimes feel that, might, might feel like you're being looked at, might feel that you're being judged. So whereas if you're a boy, it's not even something worth looking at. It's not even something worth commenting on. So once again, this problem of where does the gender gap come from? Well, it seems like parts of it have to do with social expectations to do with gender. <clears throat> so just the very last one then is gendered permission. So uh, this is just some of the things that participants brought up in, in terms of how they were permitted to do things, May maybe, but not definitely different to boys. So has everyone not gone cycling because their mad dad was like, wear a helmet, and you just didn't go? So that's one example there of having, like, I suppose, mandatory helmet use uh, cycling to school. Uh, so I live close enough to, cy to cycle to school, but I don't because my skirt and everything will get in the way of pedals. <clears throat> it's dangerous cy cycling when you're wearing a skirt. You could get caught or something. And then the participant, the, the facilitator asks, can you wear trousers there? No. So you can see there, like earlier, I was talking about the uniform. And then you can have issues of, of even having the choice to wear trousers, but it not being seen as a feminine thing, so not being used. But then on the other hand as well, there may be a permission not to wear trousers at all. And some people find that can stop them from cycling. So just a little bit about what we've been trying to do collectively then to tackle the gender gap. Uh, so we've set up the Anti-Cycles Ambassador Campaign or program. And the aim of this is to take action to enable and empower teenage girls to cycle to school, as opposed to purely encourage. It's important to actually create the conditions where you can enable and empower teenage girls to cycle to school. So some of the objectives. So number one, to develop role models and leaders for school cycling amongst teenage girls. 
Number two, empower teenage girls to shape the cycle friendliness of their institutions. And number three, provide opportunities for teenage girls to cycle. And that's what I'll conclude with. Thanks very much.